Hi, thanks for joining me. Um, today uh, I'm going to be speaking about the cost of a data breach. Um, my name is Zoe Rose. I'm a consultant here at Boringa Partners. However, I'm more commonly known as an ethical hacker. Um, basically, my experience is in technology. Um, I would build networks and then I would uh, break them. Um, and so uh, that's how I got to the point where I would um, advise clients on not just um, how to respond to an incident, but more importantly, how to prepare uh, to reduce the cost as well as um, make it just easier uh, for the business. So in the last year, I've spoken on topics such as um, secure communication systems, mitigating risk through ethical hacking, awareness training, and secure culture. What all of these talks have in common are actually how to prepare your organization for incidents. According to a 2017 cost of data breach study conducted by Farnham, um, the average global cost of a data breach to an organization is actually 2.48 million pounds or 3.68 million uh, American dollars. Um, but where does that value actually come from? Uh, obviously, it's, it's got a lot of different parts to be able to get so extravagant. Um, and then the other side of it is, due to repeated reports of the next big data breach or this happened and this happened, there seems to be almost a desensitization surrounding breaches. I'm sure you've heard the very overused term. Um, it's not, it's, it's no longer when you're breached, but it's not, sorry. No longer if you're breached, it's when. And right, we do understand that. But how is it then, with all of this media and I mean that commonly used phrase, that do data breaches still have these impressive price tags? Is it because organizations you know, uh, aren't really caring about cybersecurity or taking it seriously? I can tell you I have worked with many organizations running simulated attacks creating tailored awareness programs, and even assessing their cybersecurity maturity balanced against risks to the organization. They do care. The problem is, as our world becomes more and more connected, we're more reliant on our networks and technology infrastructure. And an incident has a greater impact across the business. There are costs you would never consider reviewing in a breach because it's part of a completely separate department that in your mind might not connect, but in reality, underneath it does. So the first set start to this talk is some commonly known data breach costs. Um, these are things like um, regulatory fines in the top left. I mean, your business typically is aware of what uh, reg regulations they need to be compliant with. And in, in, in regards to that, they'll have more of an idea of if this happens, what fines can be associated with it. Um, another uh, known cost is loss of productivity. I mean, it's pretty obvious that if your network goes down, that's going to affect the employees, not just the ones responding to the incident, but also the ones trying to just do their everyday job. Um, the next one is incident response teams. I mean, if sense reason and incident happens, you're going to spend money on either your internal in-house uh, team having overtime or your third party you've hired in. Um, the, la the bottom one is the contractual fines. Um, this one again, it's pretty common, you realize, oh yes, you're going to have to pay fines if you lose um, data from a a third party, if you're a data processor, for example, um, and it's in the contract that you, know, you won't do this or that, and it's that's reason that you may have a fine associated with that. Um, but the other side, which I will actually touch on later, is will that actually affect um, other fines that maybe you haven't lost the data, but it's caused a delay in delivering something. And the last one here is damage to or loss of assets. This can be something being physically removed, something stolen. It can also be um, something, an example, an easy example is uh, ransomware. Sometimes it actually 
ruins the device and can't be used. And, um, and that's kind of an overview of commonly known um, fees. Of course, there are more, um, but these are the ones that typically when I ask, this is what people say. Now, before we go into the um, unknown fees, the ones that I have gathered through experience that people don't realize actually are associated with it, I just want to send a reminder that if you do have questions throughout um, this broadcast, please do fill it into the uh, question box, um, and, um, and then I can get to, to, through to them at the end. Uh, but if you fill it in now, uh, you might not forget it. All right, so let's look at uncommon costs that happen during the breach. So the first one is a loss of service. Again, you might think, well, this is quite obvious, um, like an e-commerce website being taken down. I mean, that's, that's quite obvious that that would cost money. Um, but again, I'm talking about what about collateral damage? Um, it may be an incident happens and it's targeting system X, but because of where it's located, how it's connected, it actually causes a um, takedown from another system Y, for example. Um, and in your um, planning, you would want to realize that the connectivity between everything and how, um, how things are accessed will actually cause um, more um, loss of service. Uh, the number two is business continuity. I know that's a plan, and it seems weird that that, that might cost you money, but the reality is, Theoretically, yes, the organization has gone through planning um, for continuing services, you've assessed your requirements, and maybe you know the priority of moving most critical people off-site and then moving least critical people back on-site afterwards. However, reality is, last minute, you might have to rent an off-site um, place. Uh, you might have new equipment that you have to actually purchase in mass. Um, and not necessarily because it's damaged, but also is it being used uh, for investigations? Is it being used for um, uh, forensics? So that might be concerns that you actually didn't realize. Um, and the other side of it is when you're planning a business continuity, you're expecting X amount of hours or X amount of days. Sometimes it takes longer. And, and what do you do when, uh, when it's, your plan has been reached and you can't go forward? So there are costs associated with that. Um, and considerations of who can choose um, where to spend it. Um, number three is actually one that I bring up quite a bit and actually um, have had to deal with and people don't realize. And that's the pop-up call center. Humans like to feel heard, and when an incident occurs, understandably, the number of calls will drastically increase. The problem is, as I said, humans like to be, humans like to be heard. If, if they run into an incident where it's a highly sensitive breach, and all they get is an auto-messaging service, they're not going to be happy, and that will actually cost the organization more, because that's something that's going to affect your reputation. And reputations, as you would know, are very important for organizations. Um, even if it's just reciting a script, hiring a pop-up call center and having people that they, the humans, the people calling in, victims, can actually talk to and have, feel like they have a voice in this disaster, is actually going to cause um, a more positive uh, response. As I said, it could just be a script. And there have been times where, actually quite often, I'll build into the instant response team purchasing a call center or having a pre, um, predefined agreement with the call center, along with drafting scripts that can be easily grabbed and then customized. Number four is ransomware payments. So in April 2016, there was a situation where an organization, uh, we'll call them Company A, was hit with ransomware. They hired Company B, a recovery firm, to decrypt the files. As they believed, the recovery firm stated, they could decrypt it. 
without company A's knowledge, company B actually paid the ransom and decrypted the files. Whilst I disagree with how this happened, I can't say I'm surprised. There are times that organizations will realize, in the event of incident, that their disaster recovery plans are anything but adequate. The truth is, a lot of times, we have backups, but we aren't testing them, or we have backups, and then in disaster, they don't, they don't seem to work, and you have to pay the fine. The other side of this, some organizations, it simply costs too much to restore for backup, and with best intentions to not pay, in some situations, it may actually, um, should be, I've got a question saying that they can't see my slides. Uh, they sh I think they should be able to, um, if somebody from support can look at that. But basically, um, you may realize that um, it costs too much from the organization to actually restore from backup, and therefore, you're going to have to pay the ransom. And the cost there is the time to make that decision, but also then purchasing the right um, cryptocurrencies to pay it. Number five is legacy or proprietary systems. I'm not just talking, obviously, you know, you're going to have professional services. That's expected. However, if it's legacy or proprietary, do you actually have anyone on site that is skilled with that? I mean, if it's a very old system, i.e. legacy, is anybody actually able to qualify to even touch it, never mind um, investigate an incident? Um, I remember when I first started out in network, uh, with networking, I was you know, walking around this big data center uh, for this um, uh, very, very large um, uh, casino organization. And there was a wall that I wasn't allowed to touch because I didn't, you know, my, my pay grade was too low. Um, and that, in reality, is there are situations where um, you do have you do have systems that nobody's qualified to work on, and you have to bring in experts. Are they available? And do you have contracts that deal with that in interest? Um, number six, two uh, thirds. That's the security cyber security incident response team. These people are highly skilled. Internally, you might have a solid team. But there will be a limit. Um, sometimes that means you need to an escalation path. path. So um, cybersecurity deals with this, this, and this. But if it goes over their skill set, um, they do need to hire out. Um, at times, it also means, um, and what's actually quite common, is you don't have that capability in-house. And you do actually need to hire a third party to support um, your internal uh, teams and outsourcing investigations. Other considerations are, if you're dealing with a ransom situation, such as stolen data from a disgruntled employee or bad lever, you might also need a specialized negotiator. Um, as that leads into the second part of crisis response. Whilst I have separated them out, um, I do want to make special note of there are non-cybersecurity experts who need to be a part of your incident response. Consider the person who communicates to the media during a notification phase. These people need to you know, be trained um, and be available. Think of um, that airline that was a, couple, I think it was a year or so ago that were talking about a cybersecurity incident wearing one of those high-res vests. I mean, that just looked foolish and um, did get quite a bit of um, a negative response because it's like if you can't present yourself properly, then um, possibly um, you're not really responding properly. There are many people involved in incident or crisis response. And remember that incidents may carry over multiple boundaries, so getting the right people in place is important in the beginning. And it does cost money if you do it last minute. Number eight public relations. Um, so navigating the crisis can be extremely delicate, especially when 
you're in the public eye. The court of public opinion can be very, very cruel. Careful wording and understanding how the media and even the public may interpret uh, one statement is a skill set in its own. That's why you have to consider to your cost the people that are skilled in interpreting and presenting, using, maybe it's the same statement, but using different words because they know how that's going to be interpreted. interpreted. In, um, in some cases, you would want to hire the PR just to defend your reputation, restore your reputation, and even promote your brand. You know, you, you, an incident doesn't have to be the end of the world. It can be, and um, you look at, you add in the PR cost, and realize that actually it can advertise that you're working hard to fix the problem, you care about your uh, consumers, and then you talk about it later at public speaking events. There are organizations out there that do that. And from the cybersecurity perspective, from our community, it's actually looked uh, quite well on if you can do that, if you can talk about it to the community um, afterwards and say formally you recognize there was an issue and you fixed it, and this is how you did it, etc. Number nine, legal counsel. Um, it's interesting that um, prior to this, I had experience in a, a law firm, and a lot of times clients would be like, oh, well, we'll get legal counsel in at the end if we need it. However, getting them in from the beginning, which might, in a sense, cost more, um, it actually helps because if you start on the right page, they can work with the PR teams as well. You can say what you know is appropriate, um, expressing the empathy without actually saying it's our fault or bad at security. Um, you need to navigate privacy, reputation, media, and corporate law, um, which, I mean, I have a bit here and there I can understand, but I'm not a lawyer, so you know, I need to get an expert that can do that. Bringing, again, bringing a lawyer from the beginning can help effectively prioritize and understand the future considerations of costs. And um, again, when I worked before, if you are, if you potentially an incident happens and want to take legal action after, you need to do the forensic side properly. You need to have the lawyers that can provide advice and engage with third parties, such as uh, sending the cease and desist uh, letters for defamatory content. Con, uh, content, um, taking issues to court. And within that, number 10 is court orders. Again, in line with legal. legal. Did you know that court orders have no typical cost? Um, I've been involved in cases where we paid upwards of £50,000 for a disclosure order. I mean, that's not a small cost. Number 11, contractual violations. As I said earlier, Yes, whilst it is a known expense, a lot of times there's more to it than is considered. So think of business level agreements, service level agreements with your third parties. Is an incident causing not just a you know, not just a release of information, but also is it delaying a delivery somewhere else? Or has it caused an outage to a service that you wouldn't have realized? Number twelve, violations. Uh, this one, again, I, I know I've kind of repeated it, but it is a really good one to highlight um, and why you would want to bring in other non-cyber persons, um, like compliance. Have you lost third party data? The data process, are you the data processor on their behalf? Um, are there future fines that you need to consider right now for delays, but also um, future fines, fines that you need to consider um, following um, the immediate incident? Number 13, quality control. A lot of people say, well, quality control is considered um, in every, every part of our work. You know, we, we want to provide the best service. Yes, well, how embarrassing would it be if you sent your already upset customers um, highly, from the highly sensitive data breach to a phishing website instead of the actual legitimate site on your social media channel? Or maybe you were causing another instance by posting the wrong names and addresses on the notification letters. Don't laugh. Both of these things have happened recently in one organization's response. That's why you may want to consider having a specific team dedicated to quality control. 
Because remember, you're under a much higher uh, scrutiny. Um, the reason I consider that is, uh, is uh, a cost of a data breach because whilst even if you don't want to plan ahead, you might actually find in course, that other organization. You're going to have to then go through it with a much finer comb uh, because it's embarrassing. Number 14, organizational communication. Transparency is very important, especially in an incident. However, notification from one consistent channel is very is vital for the organization, but also for the victims of this breach or this incident. There was an incident when an organization wasn't ready to declare what type of cybersecurity incident had occurred. I, along with the rest of the public on Twitter, found out it was actually ransomware due to images posted by an employee of the organization. That may not sound like a big cost, but reality is it's going to affect your reputation, and therefore I've added that as a cost. Because if you have multiple channels, it can be confusing, it can cause issues to the transparency, so that uh, organization in question, and they might actually find that um, because the organization was saying, well, it was a cyber incident, we can't confirm yet, but some other employee had said, actually, it was this, um, that can actually affect people thinking that you're being transparent and actually trusting you. Number 15, private investigators. I'm talking actual investigators, people. I mean, there is one situation that I was uh, a part of where we had to hire people to travel around the world interviewing people, um, being on the ground, um, and understanding different aspects uh, with this incident. And that's not, that's not me. I, I mean, yes, I may be a cyber investigator, but this is somebody that specializes in not the computer side, but the people side. And so they go travel around, ask interview, ask questions. As you can imagine, again, that's not a small cost. Um, flights around the world, uh, meetings, that's expensive. Um, number 16, awareness training. Now, why would I mention awareness training as a cost to a breach? In a study of more than 1,000 office workers, each media found, the people that, that created this um, survey, found that 59% of employees hit by ransomware paid out of pocket for their device. The number one reason reported was shame and embarrassment. This means and because the employee did not escalate this incident, they paid out of pocket, the organization may not be aware the incident has occurred. We do have, obviously, technical controls in place, but if you work in incident response, you realize that the most vital control is the person. Ransomware may not have been the intention, if that's an example of those people that paid. It could have actually been a cover to a further breach, or maybe it's spreading. The incident response team not being, you know, bringing brought in right away and starting their investigation. They'll actually they'll actually be waiting for further events to take place, further incidents, before they're made aware, which could cost the organization organization a lot more. The reason I say awareness training is cost is because if you don't have it or if it's not effective. Um, it could actually end up costing you more. Number 17, the last point, is external communication and notification. So again, I talked about um, organizational communication above, talking about you know responding, speaking to your organization. Um, I, I didn't actually mention, but one thing there is out of bounds, so maybe the email's down, how do you present to everyone? The second, or the second point here, um, number 17, external communication. Um, it takes time to form a response. Quite a few discussions with high level persons. The organization needs to decide what they're happy with saying, knowing it will be scrutinized as things unfold, and they'll need to continuously update the public. They'll need all of those teams I mentioned above incident response, crisis response, PR, legal. We need to have a conversation with them, preparing your actual response, and then actually responding. That all has a cost. 
can be a lot more expensive than originally realized. So I'm just going to pause here again, remember, and uh, put questions in the question box. Um, at the moment I don't have any, but I'm sure you have a lot of questions relating to these different costs and examples I've seen, so please do um, ask. All right, so now that we've looked at costs in a data breach, like during a data breach, let's look at costs that maybe happen following a data breach, so late to the party. I just want to remind again that these are non-exhaustive, obviously, um, but these are things that I've dealt with. Um, the first one is individual and or group settlements. These are things like, um, you know, suing because of data that's been lost or stolen, etc. Um, due to uh, new regulations or existing regulations, um, there is actually a um, enhanced um, ability to follow, uh, to uh, pursue legal action. Um, and in the past, I've known a lot of organizations that were like, oh, we'll come to that bridge when we get to it. However, now, obviously, with these new regulations in place or more awareness around it, you're, you're going to need to consider it for uh, closer to, because whilst it is after an incident, it is going to affect the overall cost um, to the organization. And nothing's worse than finishing an incident, feeling like, OK, we've solved it, we're good to go, and then being hit with this exceptional cost. Number two um, is the IT remediation cost. This is a definite, this is required. And not only do you need to clean up after an investigation, but you're also going to make sure it's not going to happen again. Um, during the investigation, you'll realize gaps uh, in your um, thought-to-be-perfect plan because nobody creates a plan that fail, uh, creates a plan that's going to fail, not on purpose. Um, and so you need to actually address those gaps. Um, you need to get back to normal and then make it harder the next time. An example I used above, GDPR, uh, you're going to have to, if it's affected there, you're going to have to um, fix the incidents that's occurred, but also prove to the regulator that you've made changes so it won't happen again. And things like ransomware, for example, um, if you pay ransom, um, you're putting yourself on the list that will be, you, you may or may not be targeted again in the future. The likelihood is yes, you will. Um, and so being able to address that effectively is important. Um, and then the second one is the improvement. So within that, I've separated them out because you need to fix it you know, immediately and short term. But then also, you need to have an improvement plan to address those gaps. Maybe you can't address them right away, but you're going to address them in this roadmap. Um, you need to look at things such as security by design, privacy by design. A breach is a great way to highlight missing controls or features previously overlooked. It's a great way to recognize where shortcomings are. Number, uh, well, I put D on my letter, but I don't think it's uh, on the screen. But basically, lessons learned. When a breach happens, things are hectic. You may do some great things, and maybe not some, some things that maybe don't work so well. But by formalizing the lessons learned process, People will be more open about what does and doesn't work. They'll be able to provide constructive feedback and actually learn from it. Exactly. An example is you're not doomed to repeat. The reason this is a cost is because getting those people in the room is expensive. Going through this process takes time. Um, and whilst maybe at some places it's not required, in my opinion, it should be expected following a breach, you should expect to pay for this because it will help you be more secure in the future. The next one, realizing lost opportunity costs. This is a late to the party because you don't know during the incident, but 12 months following a breach, you'll start to see a picture of how expensive that incident was because of lost opportunities. 
which I don't think I need to go into here because it's pretty obvious. Um, then the next one is find some non-compliance. Uh, again, maybe it's expected, you, you know, seems obvious, but I want to highlight here, depending on regulations your organization is compliant with, there may be multiple reg regulations impacted. So maybe you're aware of what regulations you have, but not aware that multiple ones can cost you money, like at the same time, for the same instance. Take the NISD, for example, Network Information System Directive, which is for uh, critical infrastructure in, the, uh, in Europe. It does actually state in there that the competent authority can collaborate with multi-sector instance and can collaborate with multi-regulation. Um, However, like they can consider that. When I say collaborate, they can consider that when um, choosing what fine is applicable. However, that doesn't mean they will definitely reduce the fee. It just means they'll take it in consideration. They're not going to charge you twice, typically, but if it's a very big issue, uh, there'll be a lot of gaps to it and a lot of pieces that you need to um, address. Payoffs, uh, the next one actually, so it's switch page, payoffs. Uh, it might be controversial here, but there is that ongoing joke of when a breach happens, when's the CEO going to retire? The unfortunate truth is it does happen, and it's not cheap. You'll need to consider the cost of an exiting uh, exec level, um, maybe one, maybe multiple, as well as you'll need to consider um, as you'll need to consider um, bringing on more people, not just um, those leaving, but also those taking their place. The next one is increased insurance premium. So one thing that people think is, oh, I have cybersecurity insurance, um, I'll be good. The, the, real, the real reality is, um, yes, maybe they'll pay, and maybe, maybe they will cover the incident that is occurring. But the, that will also cause the premium to be raised. It's worth understanding how that's going to be impacted. It's worth considering that in your planning and your um, situation. Uh, the next one is increased costs to raise debt. Um, I'm a cyber person. This isn't really my background, but I do realize that breaches affect reputation, and it does actually affect, in turn, uh, your ability to raise debt. Um, it affects your scoring, essentially. Um, and when it you know, affects that, it's going to affect um, the overall cost of the business. It's going to be more expensive to run. Whilst it's not directly happening within the instant, it does actually later on cause problems or could cause problems. Uh, the next one is loss of customer relations. So in a survey of more than 10,000 consumers, Worldwide, um, the survey was produced by Zimlato, um, it reported that 70% of consumers would stop doing business with a company if it experienced a data breach. Whilst you might feel that value is high, consider services like Compare the Market. In the UK here, we have a site, as I said, Compare the Market, where I can go to and I have gone to and I can assess out of all the providers available for example, with water or gas, and um, what's the typical cost um, against the other ones and what's their rating. So when I personally get it, when I move, I looked at the cost, but I also looked at, well, what's the rating for customers? And if your reputation is affected because of a breach, you're going to be affected by um, that for your customers. In, in that same survey, 69% of consumers felt businesses don't take security as consumers' data very seriously. If you're a company that people think um, you don't take their personal data seriously, you don't take the security of it seriously, um, less likely you're going to get new customers as well as retain them. Loss of contract revenue. An incident handled poorly 
is going to cause a highly unlikelihood of third-party contracts being renewed. There was an incident I personally dealt with where a third party claimed they were breached. I had evidence and I produced this evidence to them that they were breached. They were sending phishing emails to their consumers from a legitimate address. I promise you that contract was quickly dealt with and no longer existed. Um, and that's because they're handling it poorly, their reputation is affected, and I don't trust that they're going to continue um, taking it seriously, but also in future if something happens, I don't know if they'd even tell me. Loss of intellectual property. This, again, might seem obvious, but people forget that intellectual property, if you don't know what it is, it's that intangible property that is the result of creativity, it's unique to your organization. Um, I've seen where breaches are, the sole purpose is actually to get the um, IP from a disgruntled employee, protect perhaps, but it also could be collateral damage. Again, because we're so connected, that's a cost to your organization, and that one is a dramatic cost to your organization. And if it's not considered, that's going to add to that uh, bottom line. Increased fraud and increased anti-fraud controls. I separated them out, but a very important um, uh, just highlight. Um, so loss of personal data will lead to identity theft, or could lead to identity theft. Um, and when an organization is responsible for that, for example, I live in the UK, um, I have a Canadian credit card that was used in the US. Wow, obviously I'm not there. I called up the credit card company and said, um, obviously I didn't do this, um, can you solve it? And instantly they said yes, they returned the fees um, and any late fees associated with it were canceled and then they went and investigated following my report, which means they upfronted the cost. That, as you can imagine, could get quite expensive um, if you're continuously doing that. And maybe it is that um, insurance is covered and it isn't a overall cost, but uh, in the future, maybe it's recovered later on, but the upfront cost is quite dramatic or could be quite dramatic. In, and added to that, you may actually want to consider increasing the anti fog controls because if you do find it a huge increase, you do find that it's costing your organization an exceptional amount, you want to add um, things so that the organization can stay vigilant and not, um, not add to that cost, essentially. So, let's this one. So we only have about five, six, seven minutes left. So again, get those questions in. Um, now that we've touched on known costs, touched on costs that arise in a breach and costs that arise following a breach, I'm just going to lighten the story because this is my background and um, tell you what you can do to minimize this overall cost and um, nightmare to your organization. So if you look at my little roadmap here, apologies if it's a bit small font, but um, the first thing is a secure culture. Developing a security conscious, safe environment that consumers feel safe to report, but also being supportive of security researchers can encourage a privacy by design culture across the organization, a security by design culture, because Again, these employees, if they feel safe to report, they're not going to, theoretically, they're not going to pay out of pocket. They're going to raise the issue in the beginning and have the incident response team start right from the, uh, begin right from the start. Uh, the next one, incident response, crisis response. Having these people together, ready, prepared to go, um, can make a big impact. Um, again, cybersecurity, legal compliance, communications, public relations, investigators, negotiators. Whatever your business is um, and what the critical assets, the, what will kill your business, you know, you know that, you know the risks, you know the scenarios, um, you know typically who's going to need to be there to respond, or you should, um, and then you can get them to begin with, you know, a last minute um, negotiation of 
fees, such as hiring a third party incident response team, um, it's going to cost you a lot more. Versus uh, having a contract with competitive rates in it, um, and it can be more favorable to your organization. It can actually reduce that fee. Again, disaster recovery plans, uh, business continuity, um, in the next part, sorry, having a plan, uh, that will actually you know, make a difference. Um, and stating these together, they are very separate. Uh, not just having the plan, but then actually testing it and finding the gaps and fixing it will make a much lower cost. Um, you're not learning on the job, essentially. You're running through it, understanding it, and able to um, address things more effectively. Planning ahead, again, still cost less. Um, decision making, risk appetite. Uh, you're going to know your likely scenarios, which I will go to in a second. Um, and large decisions may need to be made in those scenarios. Um, need, your organization will need to know what their stance is, what their risk appetite is. They're, they'll need to have well documented and able to reference uh, in the event of an incident, both in digital but also physical form in some situations because maybe your um, network's down. Um, you don't want to. You don't want to think. Well, you know, we can call this person because instance, Don't wait for the most convenient time for the team. It may be the decision makers out of contact, or someone else needs to take temporary ownership. And um, if, if this is the case, they need to inform, be informed on the decisions made and be able to apply them creatively. So understand why that decision is made, um, as well as again emergency communications. Don't make this decision last minute. Um, be able to communicate um, when things are offline um, and be effective in you know, uh, going through your plan. The last one, likely scenarios. Uh, testing people, process, policies, technologies. You know, again, you know what your organization is uh, typically going to be vulnerable to, the risks. Um, you'll have a threat map. You'll understand that. Uh, and therefore, you can run through these scenarios, training your incident response team, hardening your documentation, making sure that it touches everything, closing those gaps, and recognizing controls that may be on in place currently. Again, I don't have any questions, um, but if you do, please add it in the next couple minutes. Um, not saying these are all the costs to a breach, um, but these are things that commonly are forgotten. Um, and addressing them up front can actually reduce the overall cost and make that exceptionally large number at least that tiny bit smaller. Um, this is highlighting, obviously, the variety of costs. Understanding preparation is key. And at the end of the day, failure is possible, likely even. However, that does not mean it is time to raise our hands in failure. It means it's time to recognize the responsibility we have to our consumers realize that we hold the power to protect personalization and stand up and be a part of the solution. Okay, well, I don't have any other questions, so I'm going in there. Thanks for having me.